I think my childhood, I think, was designed for me from a young age, basically fulfill the dreams of my father, you know. Well, here you heard it from the man himself. David Hodgson joins me today, former Liverpool player, former Gateshead star in the in the making when he was born in Gateshead. I welcome you to the show. Thank you, Jamie. I'm really looking forward to it. It's a pleasure and thank you for asking me. It's a, as I said, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on. You know, former Norwich, Middlesbrough, Liverpool, even a European Cup finalist and winner. So start us off then, David. Talk us about your early days playing football in Gateshead. Okay, so we'll start off, we'll start off in Gateshead, which was the starting point in my life. Um, grew up surrounded with te well, not teammates, obviously, Jesus Christ, that's a terminology too easy to use for me now. Uh, surrounded by mates who all wanted to play football, everybody. Um uh, and, and with that, you're always going to get the competitive edge, especially in street football. When you look back, and I'm and I'm so grateful for for all the all of my mates, and I could reel them all. I wrote a book, and I made sure I give every single one a mention because without them growing up and being there and playing with on the streets, do you get to where you're going to get to? I would like probably say no, I would not. Okay, so for them, I'm extremely grateful. But I think I had a father who who had the opportunity to be a pro. Lincoln and Arsenal wanted him. He just got married, obviously, to my mum. And he didn't want to, he didn't take that step. So I think I was his dream. He pushed me down, didn't push me down, but guided me in theory to be playing football on a regular basis. So my upbringing was, I think, designed to be a, a football player. Yeah. Do you remember your first time with the football, the first memory that you ever have? No, no, no. I, I, I don't recall any sort of uh, instances as a child. Obviously, look, I can, I can recite playing on the on the pitches with the lads I can recite uh talking during the game as if as if as if I was Colin Todd I actually wanted to be Colin Todd believe it or not who was a young player and so I sort of pretend I was like a Colin Todd and I would be talking describing what pass I was making all that I, I remember that basically you know um but in terms of um uh, of, of any other visions, not really. I remember one specific instance, which is there, it's in my head, it's never gone. I remember getting injured in a, in a schoolboy game uh, against Springwell. Uh, I would have probably been 14, 15 at the time, and I got a knee injury. And my father left me to walk home. And when I look back, and it was a fair walk, by the way, okay? It was a fair walk. I wasn't sure if that was having a little bit of a pot at me for the silly challenge that made that got me injured? Or was it one of those where, okay, we'll toughen you up. I'm not, I, I really don't know. But I, I remember the incident, I remember the injury, and I remember the journey home. So there, there was sort of one moment in my life which sort of, in a way, moulded me because it was something that if I ever went in for a tackle and one or two, one against Peter Schill, and I'll never forget it, Anfield. And... Um, if I got injured, I didn't let it be known. Just got the hell up and got on with it. Do you think that's what's changed then over the years? Where we see now that probably wouldn't happen. You know, their parents would probably take them home and they would probably have to go to the doctors where maybe people have become a bit weaker, whereas you would have just continued to play. I think it's. I think society's changed. I think the, the, from a footballing perspective, the refereeing aspect is all. We know that's all changed, OK? We, we've seen it with, with the way that the players are protected now. Somebody made a post the other day about David Webb, former Chelsea player. He was a hard player, by the way. I played him very young in my age, but he was at the back end of his career. These guys didn't get a red card unless they broke your leg. And if, and if you got hurt, you didn't let anybody know. You just got up with it. Now, would you prefer that? Or do you prefer the bit today where they roll around as if they've been shot with a machine gun uh, and, 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 and fake injury? Well, to be honest with you, I prefer my era. Yeah, hundred percent. Well, that's proper football, isn't it? That's that's where the roots of the of the football came. But what do you think changed that then? What do you think was the was the main turning point of of that? I think a lot of things in life are changed by people who are not actually involved in the sport. And I think people from outside of the sport, we get all these scientists coming into the game, sports nutritionists medical staff who've never played. Look, I'm not saying because you haven't played, you don't deserve the right to have your say, okay? But I think all of this came into the game. I think there was one there was one turning point I may add. It, we used to go through an apprenticeship, 16 to 18 years of age. At 18, you got told if you kept on or you worked. There was two years of your life, you had to make the most of it, okay? 
Those two years of my apprenticeship at Middlesbrough Football Club, and I will say were the best two years of my life, both from a football perspective, from the fact that we're getting coached by a great coach guy called Bobby Murdoch, and at the same time, getting taught the values of what it was like to be a pro footballer. Howard Wilkinson, if I remember rightly, Howard took all that system away and introduced a completely new system. And that took away all of the things that we had to do, clean boots, do the balls, change the, uh, wash the showers out, wash the, the change rooms out, uh, run to the shops for the players, etc. None of that exists anymore. That was the starting point where football changed and the direction it was going was that the, the, the hard labour aspect was taken away from the game. And I think that applies on the pitch as well. The, the the cleaning of the boots and the cleaning of the showers is, is discipline, you know, and now we see with the younger players coming through, not to mention any names, but they, but they won't even turn up to training some of them because they're unhappy that they're not playing or they're not, something's not going right for them. But you must disagree with that. You must think that they should still clean out the showers and clean the boots. No, listen, I have to accept society's changed. If, if, if you ask me if I had a choice, I would go back to the old system. I'd go back to the old system, not just because of that, that it does discipline you. It makes you respect your elders. It makes you want to be in that change room as a pro so you don't have to do all that stuff, okay? So that side, I fully, fully would love to change and go back to. Um, obviously, the other side is today, the kids at 18, they, they, I don't think the word respect exists in football. I mean, admiration might sort of be there that you see a senior pro, maybe a kid at Man City, and he's passing De Bruyne or whatever, and he might call it. Okay. From a respect point of view, I don't think it's in. I don't think it's there. I think it's gone out near enough gone out of society. Okay, I'm pretty certain. Um, so I would definitely go back to the old school way, and I'd certainly go back to the old school way in terms of footballing. 16 to 18 apprenticeship, 18 pro. You either played in the reserves or you played in the first team. If you're good enough and you got the reserves quickly, and then you went the first team, fantastic. If you're in the reserves at 20, chances are you won't get kept on either. And you've gone off to another club. Today, they've got 16s, under 18s, under 21s, under 23s, 40, 50 kids. Take into consideration that only three of those kids out of them 50 were actually going to make it. 47 are there just to make numbers up, to make up some type of system that the game now exists with. Under 21s, under 18s, blah, blah. For me, get rid of all that. Reduce the squads, reduce the numbers in a football club, reduce the financial burden on a football club. Take it all back to where it was. It worked for us before we, hey, listen, we won the World Cup under them systems. We haven't even got close to win the World Cup. We've got the quarterfinals, the semis. We've never even got close in theory. So what was right now where we don't win nothing or back then when we won everything? And our teams were the kings of Europe back then as well, by the way, okay? In the 60s, the 70s, 80s, okay? So... My opinion would be, and I'm open-minded, okay? I'm not some old 63, 64-year-old guy with, with, with all that generation. No, but perfectly, that's where I would go. So you were lucky enough to get an apprenticeship at Middlesbrough. So maybe not the other 23s or the, the squads that, like you said, are there to make up the numbers. So to get off the apprenticeship by Middlesbrough, how did that come about? So I, I played at a boys' club where quite a few guys, Gaza came through the same boys' club as me. Uh, Reggie Boys' Club. Quite a few lads came through it, okay? We're not the pro clubs. So Redford Boys Club sort of was like a bit of a feeder club in Middlesbrough. But at that time, I had other choices. So I'd gone to Ipswich. I won't touch on the story what actually took place there, but I lost that opportunity through my own. I told you before I could have gone that way or that way in football. Well, on this occasion in Ipswich, I went that way and lost the opportunity to, to be at Ipswich Sound, okay? However, I got offered a two-year apprenticeship and a two-year professional. Guaranteed contract of Bolton Wanderers Football Club. Okay? I went and trained. I actually trained with the first team, even though I was 16 at the time. I would have been 15 because I hadn't left school. Okay? Trained with the... Well, could have been the reserves, but there was senior pros in there, ex man U players who were nothing. So I trained them. They must have seen something and thought, you know what? We want to tie this kid up. So I got offered a two-year apprenticeship two-year pro. Middlesbrough Football Club had got wind of that, even though I'd probably been down there for training, and they came at the last minute and offered me a two-year apprenticeship. I had a choice. I went to my father and said, right, what are you? He said, no, you make the decision, because if I tell you to do this, 
and it goes wrong, you'll hold it against me for the rest of your life. Great bit of advice. And I've used it on so many occasions, okay? And with that, I took the gamble and signed for Middlesbrough on a two-year apprenticeship. So Redshift Boys Club were near enough and sort of like, they had the, they had the, they had the, 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 the qualities of how a professional club was run. Everything was done correctly. So I had a bit of grounding before, before eventually getting to Middlesbrough. But because of their, the way that football club run, Middlesbrough was a no-brainer for them to have a link to them. And that was my start from Redgiff to, to the borough. Yeah. So then when you ended up at Middlesbrough, you know, you said that you were kind of there with some of the things. Maybe you had to clean the boots and you had to clean the boots at Middlesbrough as well. But what yeah. was new then? What was new to take that huge step up to such a, such a big club? I'll tell you, it was so difficult. Okay, first off, you move away from home. You live, in our case, we lived in a place called the Medhurst Hotel, which, which was put together by Harold Shepherdson, a former 1966 World Cup assistant manager. Okay, in today's world, he'd be a sporting director. Okay, but back then, incredibly forward thinking. So he he put this, this big house together. We had cleaners in the house, obviously, ladies who came in every day. We had a landlady who looked after us, took care of us, made all the food, but we got the food that was in which was right for being a football player. So for two years, obviously, I'm in, I'm in this particular house here. Then with that, you're in an environment surrounded by lads who all want the same thing. They all want to be a pro of their team. In our case, Middlesbrough were very successful. Some didn't make it. Some didn't get kept on, okay? So there was a competitive edge every day. Your, your, your pros that you were looking after, the boots were shinier than anybody else's. All of those things with all was competitive and, and driving you towards being a, a, better, a better pro, a better player. So for me, that, that environment of two years living in, in, in the Meadows Hotel was, was incredible. You ended up playing over 100 games for Middlesbrough, scoring 16 goals. But talk to me about that debut, that debut game. So you've now beaten the majority of those lads to arguably the shirt to play and represent a club what was that feeling like that debut game for Middlesbrough um two two of my teammates or, or two of the apprentices with me at the time had just gone in prior to me maybe from a positional sense their position became uh, open to them a, a little bit earlier than me lad called Craig Johnston who went on to play at Liverpool midfield player Mark Proctor who's my closest friend he went on also a midfield player. so that their door opened up a little, a little earlier for them. In front of me was two potentially Middlesbrough legend, David Mills and John Hicks. So I had to wait my time, you know. Um, but the, getting my actual, I think my starting debut is the one thing I remember. That was against Bristol City. I remember coming on in games. I actually scored, I think it was against QPR. I think I came on as a substitute, scored against QPR. That was my first goal. But my first starting moment was against Bristol City, Essen Park. And the centre-back on that particular day was Norman Hunter. Now, for anybody from my era, of my era, will know that Norman Hunter was ruthless. Absolutely ruthless. He was a leg-breaker, okay? But also an England national and also a former Legion United legend who could play. He also happened to come from the same town as me in Gateshead, okay? Prior to the game... My coach was a guy called Jimmy Greenhoff, not the ex-player, as in from Manchester United. Um, he, he came through the system with Jack John. He said to me, probably 10 minutes before we went out on the pitch, Hodgie, listen, I'm going to give you some advice today. This is your starting moment. You have to make an impact. And you have to make an impact with a certain set of fans called the chicken run, okay? Opposite the tunnel, it meant being said. If you win them over, life will be a lot easier for you out there. If you don't win them over, it'll be tough. Don't know why you told me about a specific set of fans or why you didn't use a different terminology about it's your debut, you've got to do this or do that. Make sure you do this, make sure you come off and join the game. And I remember going up for a header and I was always a little bit of a nasty person as a player. And I went up and I smashed Norman Hunter full on in the face. And down he went. And he lay on the floor for about five minutes. 
And then eventually the, the, the medical team were on and got him right, blah, blah, blah. But that, that moment of then, I'm not just thinking the chicken run, but I think the actual general fans of Middlesbrough Football Club in the, in the entire stadium thought, we've got a kid here who's got off a chance because I was more than happy to go and mix it with the elders, you know. And in this case with Norman. Thank God he didn't break my leg. He probably wanted to, probably tried to, if I remember rightly. But that was my stone debut man against Bristol City. And, and that is the one thing that sort of stays very clear in my head to this day. Then you moved to Liverpool for £455,000. We're not talking millions. It's, it's back in the day, £450,000 to get you the move yeah. to Anfield. Do you remember the contact? Was that agents back then that would have helped you? No, or was no, it just no, meeting no. someone on the street? No. That transfer that year happened to be the highest paid transfer sum for a player that particular that particular season. Okay, so the, the crazy thing about football, we had a, an opening day at Ayrson Park where all the fans were allowed to come in uh, as players. We had to go around different uh, different stages of the pitch and and to have photographs taken, do autographs, etc. And while I was there, Jim Platt, uh, who was then my teammate, came up and he said, um, uh, "Bobby wants to see you." Bobby Murdoch wants you to see it. And I said, oh, why? He said, uh, Liverpool have come in for you. So Jim knew before me. And I said, all oh, right, Jesus. Anyway, so I went to see Bobby. And he said, Hodgie, look, I don't want you to go, but we have no choice. If we don't sell you as a football club, we are in financial difficulty. Um, we could spend the next 30 minutes talking about that, bro. We won't because we, we want to drag, we want to spread this out. But my initial reaction was, I ain't gone. And anybody would say it here. Yeah. Even my girlfriend back then said, are you serious? And I said, well, hold on here. This is how I am as a human being, okay? I don't chase dreams. I like happiness. And if I'm happy, I can't get any happier. I see it as being that's where I'm at. And that's where I was at in my life, playing the first team at Middlesbrough, adored by the fans, I, I suppose you could say at the time, blah, 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 and was extremely happy. Why is if I go to Liverpool going to make that any better than what it was? Yes, of course, you're going to win, etc., etc. But at the end of the day, I was extremely happy. So my initial reaction was to turn it down, which I did. Um, and then obviously it, it, it got reignited again one or two days later. Excuse me, one or two days later. And then within no time at all, I'm in the car with Harold Shepherds and the chap I mentioned earlier, driving me down Anfield and, and basically in a situation where I had to say yes and no then and on the spot. And I, I, I said yes. I didn't say yes for me. I said yes because I knew if I didn't, Middlesbrough Football Club were in huge, huge, huge financial dis disarray. You didn't just join Liverpool from Middlesbrough. You were also an England under-21 player. So again, you're now representing your country at this stage. Again, what was that feeling like to get that call? Or was it just a, was it just meeting somebody again? No, I'm always embarrassed to... <laughs> actually say this to you because again it's a bit like me being happy i i didn't grow up and you know you hear kids say oh i dreamed of this and i dreamed of that i didn't have them dreams i didn't dream that one day i would be able to play and represent my country or be able to i played one at b level but i didn't go dream of that so when i remember being in the national anthem being selected uh, first game, I think, was against Republic of Ireland at Anfield. Crazy, crazy. But I was also a Middlesbrough player at this point, by the way. Okay. And myself, Mark Proctor, Craig Johnson, I think the three of us went down. And I remember standing in the, in, 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 the, in the thingy while the national anthem was being played. And I look around and, I, and lads were singing the national anthem. I didn't even know the words to it, for Christ's sake. Okay. And I didn't feel that, that buzz that you get playing for England. I really, honestly, I did not. I just stood there. Blah, blah, blah. Actually, I'm done, finished, got on with the game. And every time I was selected, I didn't like rush to the phone and pick the phone up and ring back to my father and say, Dad, Dad, Dad I've been selected for England again. I just didn't. And was I wrong? Was I, was I not um, respecting what had, what had been given to me? I don't know. I just, but I played and I played well for England. I, and and did very, very well for England, I may add. But yeah, but that, that moment, wasn't one of those moments that I look back and think, oh my God, I remember that. But at the same time, I then got to know another group of players who I've stayed close with, Gary Shaw, Sammy Lee, Justin, passionate who passed away. Justin was a close friend of mine. 
and, and many others. So I also formed some great friendships in that on, in that in that England setup. Yeah. Do you think that was better then to not be over, you know, over uh, aroused in a way that you played better because maybe you didn't feel that it mattered so much to you? I don't know. You know what? You, that's a good question. That nobody's ever asked me that before. So, so in a way, I sometimes think, had I really understood where I was and the fact that I'd been selected to play for my country when thousands upon thousands will never, ever get the chance, would that have made me more determined, more hungry to go on and play in the full, full national side? I don't know. I remember sending my passport in for the, which would have been then the, would I be right? Would it be the 1980 or would it be the 82 World Cup in Mexico? I'm trying to remember what it was now. I remember having to hand my passport in because I potentially was going to be on the list of whatever. And then the draw short list up. And anyway, thank God I got my passport back because I was going on holiday. But I remember that happening. And but I didn't obviously make that squad. And at the time, England was very strong on a on a on a frontline aspect. So yeah. Maybe had I got that opportunity at that point, then it made me want to drive on to be one of those that wants to get 25 caps, 50 caps, 75 caps, 100 caps. I don't know. But yeah, but going basically under 21s, I played for England, but I never really, really understood how, how important it was at that, t- at that, at that time, which is just me as a character. Well, your Liverpool debut was to fill in some big boots for Kenny Dalglish, one of the biggest players to ever play in the Liverpool shirt. And you actually won that game 1-0 in a charity shield game at Wembley. Yeah, against Spurs, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. yeah, against Spurs, yeah. Um, yeah, so we played in pre-season. I'd done very well, I may add. Okay, so uh, anyway, back then there was only, I think there was only one sub, I think, if I remember rightly. So... <laughs> I haven't played every game for the Borough and, and, and had it played against Liverpool, I'd been hugely disappointed if I'd signed for a football club and I don't make that, that start in the 12 at the time, you know. So, yeah, I came on for Kenny. Actually done quite well in the game as well, I remember, um, against Spurs. Probably should have scored. Had a, a, good, a good opportunity. One or two opportunities. One, I should have scored if I'd been a little bit more clinical. I probably would have finished or a bit more ruthless. I probably would have taken the opportunity on as opposed to trying to... It, it, to feed any rush on the left-hand side of me. Um, but at the, at the end of the day, I'd gone on, done well, did what I had to do. And then, but the, the crazy thing from that is the following weekend is the start of the season. And the one thing that I know and certainly existed in my time was when you signed for Liverpool, only a very, very elite few actually went straight into the start of 11. That was the history of the club. I think Mark Lawrenson was one, obviously Graham Suness will have been one, probably Kenny, of course. But there was lots who didn't who, when they signed, had to go through the Liverpool system, playing in the reserves, learning what the club was about, learning about the system, where they played, the culture, the mentality. And I sort of got straight into the start in 11 and got off to a great start. I think at one point I'd scored four goals, a swing rush, he hadn't scored any. Then I think I got to five in my game, and I got to five rush, he got to 35. But however, um, yeah, so got off to a great start. And to tell you the truth, you know where it all went wrong for me? came to play in a charity game, not a charity game, and a testimonial for a guy called John Craggs at Middlesbrough. And on that night, one of my old teammates caught me with a tackle on from the side on and damaged my knee ligaments. And even though I got back to Liverpool the next day, the problem was you could not be injured at Liverpool. If you're injured at Liverpool, you're out. And I sort of tried to play with it for a while. And then eventually, I remember getting taken off at Swansea and I must have had a bad game because I remember Terry Mack coming on the pitch and said, hey, let me mark your card. It was funny when I look back, how, how did he come out? With it? He came on and said, hey, you must be bad the day, Hodgie, for me to be replacing you. <laughs> and I remember it. And he was right. But it wasn't because I couldn't play. And it wasn't because I wasn't good enough. I'd, I'd, I'd already proven that I was all those things. The problem was I was trying to play with an injury. And the way that my game was structured, the way that I played... It, I suffered. And that was probably a little bit of a turning point in, in, in my, my early days in, in Anfield, yeah. Maybe not that game specifically, but these games are very different to how they how they were when, when you were playing, for example, this cup final. What was the build-up like to these games? Was Were the fans more engaged with the, with the players or were they a bit further apart? Again, 
you know, probably if I'd gone to any other club, I would have understood it and appreciated it. But Liverpool, it didn't mean anything to them. It was like another game. Um, the fans, they'd already been there. The Liverpool fans have had so much success over the years leading up to my arrival there, for sure. Um, with European Cup games, winning the titles, winning and win, winning Cup games, you know, outside of the European circuit, it was like another game for them. And I'm, I remember walk, I remember going down the tunnel, and the players were all waving. And I'm thinking, and I remember saying my the same thing. And I, I remember turning to, I think it was Alan Kendi, and said, "Bonnie, how do they know their wives are up there? I couldn't see anybody." He said. Hodgie, we've been here many times, we've got season tickets up there. Something like that, right? There, there you go, what a comment. We've been here that many times, our wives have got season tickets up there. And now they were all just waving. It was, it was amazing. And, I, and I, So for them, it was just another game. And I sort of, in a way, just sort of fell into that mindset where maybe if I'd been all hyped up and psyched up and everything else, I might have appreciated it more, but I tried to be, you know, sort of in, in, in with that sort of give the image that yeah it's just another game but it wasn't in theory but you, you, that was the impression I probably give you I'm not entirely sure if you've heard it but I keep hearing it where they keep where other fans from other clubs or people in general just say that the Anfield crowd has become more silent quiet less loud but on the European nights it's still there but for these league games that are happening maybe versus a Wolves or a West Ham there's just no support behind the players do you see that or do you think that's still the same I'll tell you, I'll tell you what my theory is on it I'll tell you what my theory is on it is I think it exists at clubs like Liverpool I think it exists at clubs like Man United the fan base of those clubs today are not from the city anymore okay the people who buy those tickets to go and stand on the cop and to send the seats, etc., are people from all over the country and all over the world. Okay, you can go to a game and you could be stood next to somebody from Scandinavia, you could sit with somebody from Germany, you could be stood with, with somebody. It, it, listen, it exists. So that cop today is not all Liverpoolians. It's a combination of people from all over the world, all different societies, who now go to watch Liverpool Football Club play, and the same applies at Man U. And I think that's what that's what football has lost in theory. Okay, um, that, that's an opinion. I'd love somebody to go and and and, and take a, a data thing and ask somebody when they're going into the terrace. Where are you from, Denmark? Where are you from, Scandinavia? Uh, Sweden? Where are you from, Germany? Where are you from, Belgium? Where are you from, Holland? Blah, blah. And actually find out how many scousers stand on the cop. It'd be interesting. I wish somebody would do it just to find out. But that's I think that's why Liverpool, apart from the big nights, don't have that cop environment that they had many years ago, back in the 80s and the 90s. So a week after that win versus Tottenham, it was another win, another 2-0 win over West Bromwich Albion at Anfield. And you were playing alongside Kenny Dalglish and Ian Rush. So again, big names and representing such a big club. Was that my debut for Liverpool? Well, that was your league debut, yes. Uh, West my league debut. Albion. Well, you know better than I did. I didn't know it was against West Brom. Okay, so I think... On that particular game, they changed the system from what yes. they normally did to accommodate, yeah, to accommodate me in there. I'm not sure if it was there was a combination of the change at the back. I think Alan Hansen, Phil Thompson, Mark Lawrence might have played at the back. And they changed the, the formation in order for Kenny uh, to take a deeper role as opposed to his normal role alongside uh, Rushy. And I took up the role, obviously, alongside Ian, you know. So... In a way, yeah, listen, I'm quite proud of that. The fact is that somehow Liverpool just juggled things around in order for it to get me out on the pitch. I, I assume that must have been the reason behind it. So, yeah, it was a different formation. I think people say, did you get nervous before game? I, I honestly can't remember. I remember going down the tunnel. Obviously, I'd, we'd had practice games on the pitch. And, and of course, I knew the, the history where you, all the players, this is Anfield, OK? And I remember going down... Slightly embarrassed doing that on the this is Anfield sign. Yes. Why? I was just I'd only just been there six weeks. Was I Liverpool through and through? No. Uh, did I have the same mentality as Sammy Lee, uh, who was a you know or Phil Thompson, who were born and bred in the city of Liverpool, and they knew what it meant to hit that sign? I must have hit it. I must have gone down, thought you prat, and go, you know, this is Anfield, like all the players did. So 
that will have taken place. And I honestly can't remember anything about the game. I truthfully can't. I remember the Spurs game. I remember the Wembley, the Charity Shield. But I can't remember any any instance in that West Brom game that, that in my head, would make my debut, which is mad to think back that you can't remember what the hell happened in your debut for Liverpool Football Club. But as I said, I, I'd played against Liverpool many times. I'd played against West Brom so many times. So it wasn't like a, a big occasion as such. It was my debut for another club. It must have been a big occasion when you scored at Highbury versus Arsenal in a 2-0 win in the, on the 4th of September, 1982. Well, I know that goal. And I remember that goal. That was my first goal. And it wasn't so much the goal itself. If anyone sees the goal at that time, they claimed or it was reported as uh, as one of the, the 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 perfect goals that we touched the ball. They never had a touch it. I remember Mark Launching going back towards our goal, getting the ball, turning out, and X amount of passes. I was involved in the passing formation, uh, blah blah blah. And then all of a sudden, I'm Rushy. Not normally the case of Rushy making the run down the side, but it was Rushy who crossed it and I finished. And I remember the goal quite easily, quite well, to tell you the truth. And but I distinctly remember people saying it was one of the best goals ever because. And Liverpool played one touch and two touch, touch from one end of the goal to the other. So I remember that goal. And to be honest with you, over the years, it's it's found itself on the social media scene and whatever it may be, if, whether it be that time of the year or whatever it may be. But I, I have seen it many times since, you know. Yeah. Before we talk about what happened after that Arsenal game, how would you personally sum up the start of your Liverpool career? I thought the start was probably better than what they expected. Truthfully, nobody ever said that to me. Nobody ever came up and they get, that's another thing with Liverpool. They just expect you to play at that level every single week. Okay. And they don't heap praise on you at all in any shape or form. Whereas at Middlesbrough, they, they, I don't say hype me up. They heaped so much praise on me that when I went down that tunnel, I felt six foot two and I'm five foot ten. At Anfield, that's that doesn't come your way. They just expect you to deliver. So I, I'd gone from one culture of being praised and, and respected, and the club needed me to be out there, to Liverpool, where you don't get any praise whatsoever. So you're down to your own mental devices to, to, to deal with it. So for me. That's the one thing that I, that I look back on and probably suffered. I didn't have the mental strength to be a Liverpool player. I had the cap the technical ability, I had the qualities, the strength, the pace, the technique, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I just did that, had that missing element of the mental strength. Two more goals in a 4-3 win. Uh, over Forest at Anfield four days after the Arsenal game. So you've now gone in the space of two weeks to win a, a community shield, to play West Brom, and then to score against Arsenal. And then against the Forest. I remember the Forest game. And I'll tell you why I remember the Forest game, because I remember coming in at half time, and I remember Joe Fagan and Bob Paisley going absolutely ballistic that we were playing too much football. I mean, how crazy is that? We were doing probably what Man City are doing today. And... And, and, and Joe and Bob, Bob Paisley, the manager at the time, said, chaps, on your way, that there's a goal where the ball's supposed to go into. Okay? And stop the... I can't remember the terminology that Joe would have used, but it would be funny, that's for sure, um, in terms of a pass on. But yeah, I remember the... And I'll tell you what I remember about that game. Is Yes, I scored, but Mark Proctor, my very, very close friend, was playing for Forest that night. And whenever he'd done something well... Because we'd grown up together as kids at the borough. We, we were the first team together. We, I lived with his parents, so we were so close. And I remember him making passes and I was saying to him, I used to call him Charlie. His name was Mark Proctor, but I called him Charlie's nickname. Charlie, what a pass. I'm actually giving him praise on the pitch for the passes he's making. But funny enough, I can't remember him coming up and patting me on the back and saying, good goal, Hodgie. But anyway, I, I remember that part of the game because... Mark's family, his mom and his dad, who, who again I lived with, they were all at the game that night. But the goals, are, I, I, can't, I remember getting two goals. I, I can't remember how the goals came about, truthfully. Um, I don't think they were in the cop end. I think they were in, in, in the opposite end of the cop. So, but I remember the game for them reasons to do with Bob and Joe going on about playing too much football. 
and they, they wanted an end result and i.e. for somebody to score some goddamn goals. Yeah. Bob Paisley, what was he like as a manager and as a man? Oh, how, how can you describe him? Quiet, funny, but I don't think he knew he was funny. He was a Geordie, which made life easy for me. When I first went, he, he, he made a point of that. Very, 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 very simple in the philosophies, but their philosophies were so far ahead of everybody else from a simplicity aspect. I got on great with them. But I, I, there, there's one funny little story. Well, there were several, but this one in particular was funny. Um, I don't swear, okay? But unfortunately, I have to swear because I'm going to take Bob Paisley off here to a certain extent. There was a reporter called John Gibson, who was a big, big reporter in the northeast of England for the Evening Chronicle. And he'd come down to do an article on me. And uh, I was coming out of the change rooms with the gaffer, which was Bob Paisley. And there was John and myself, the three of us were coming out together. And John said, I, Bob, how's he done? Has he settled in? He said, yeah, he's settled in well. He used to talk with a very, very low voice. He settled in well. Really, really effing happy. He said, but there's one effing thing we haven't got our head around yet. And he was on about himself and the staff. He says, he can go down that wing at 100 miles of an hour. <laughs> And he can pick a pass out and drop it right on in Rushy's head. He says, but he can't hit the ball between two pieces of wood that don't move. <laughs> <laughs> and it was honestly, it was just how he said it. I had to laugh. I probably shouldn't have laughed, right? I had to laugh. I did laugh. And he was so right. Here he was. He had this player who had the ability to run at 100 miles an hour, beat people. And I will pick you out. If you're in the box, I will pick you out. I did that long before I arrived at Liverpool and I did it thereafter. It was just, that was my one of my little gifts of football. I could make a pass when other people couldn't. At 100 miles an hour, okay? But yet, I couldn't put the ball between two white posts that didn't move. How is that possible? Was it the pressure? Composure. I think composure obviously is the key factor. Natural instinct to do it. But in saying that, I scored so many goals as a kid. I scored so many goals when I played in reserve football. So maybe pressure could be the word. Okay. Um, I did. I scored. I scored goals. But first team goals were few and far between. You, like you mentioned earlier, I think about nineteen or twenty at the Borough in one hundred and fifty games. That's no great record. But I think I got ten or. 10 or 13 at Liverpool, or 10 or something, in 50, 40 games or 50 games. So it was like one in four, where I'd only got one in 10 previously type thing. Pressure is probably the right word, but composure, I think, is, is the key word, where you've got that ability just to just slow down at that, what, that split moment and, 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 and execute what you have to do, how you score the goal. Or it's without thought, in case of Ian Rush, he was just as quick, and he would come to balls at 100 mile and just slot in the bottom corner. So he was he was gifted. It was history of Liverpool says that. So it's one of those things. But that story with Bob is there right now at the very front of my head after all these years. And I can still recite it and I can still see him and I can still see him laughing. And I was laughing with him. So yeah. Talk to me about the European debut that you've had in the biggest competition of them all, you would say. You know, a really big competition that Liverpool have won so many times against the Irish side Dundalk, where I believe you scored again. I scored there, yeah. I think it, I think probably what took the edge off that was, if you think about it, it was Dundalk. Okay? We weren't going to play a team in Italy or Spain or Germany or France or Belgium. We, unfortunately, we're playing a small little Irish team called Dundalk, who rightly should have been there because they won their league and and, and, and that, that was what the competition was about. That doesn't happen. Well, I don't think it happens today. But um, so in a way, it doesn't quite have that sort of glory of pride. Oh, you played against Juventus and you scored on your debut in the European Cup. You scored against Dundalk. So, but listen, at the end of the day, I had to take part and I had to, the opportunity had to be there for me. And I, and I took it and scored. Yeah, so I didn't realise I'd scored on my debut in the European Cup of Liverpool, but... 
So you're telling me things I don't know, by the way. So <laughs> you've definitely done your research, which is credit yourself. So Thank apart you. from that game, I can't. I think if the, I, I might be right, we went there at the height of the troubles in Ireland. And I remember certainly a trip to Ireland. It must be that game where we we got escorted by huge police convoy front and back to get us the game. And I think that might have been Dundalk because I I have that memory in my head. So that that might have been one of those things that stuck in my head about Dundalk. But I can't remember the game and I certainly can't remember the goal at all. Do you remember the time where you were overlooked in Liverpool where, you know, you've started really well and then you didn't play up until Christmas and then you played against Aston Villa and picked scored up, the opener? I, I picked up an injury, which I which I said, I picked up an injury in a testimonial, uh, knee ligaments. Um, and then there was a spell where I contracted a, a, a virus called Quincy's. And that, that was also a period in the Liverpool where it took me out of the lineup for... X amount of games. I think had I not had the knee ligaments, truthfully, but that's part of the game. Okay, so you have to accept that. And I hadn't had the Quincy's issue, which was sort of like an, an illness that at the time they didn't diagnose. It took me a little while to do it. By then, I was severely ill. You know, I was really, really poorly. I think if I hadn't had those, my Liverpool record would have been up in the 70s and the 80s, 70s for sure. Okay, and then, then you're nearly at the 100 games for Liverpool, which I, I suppose is a bit of a landmark for anybody. So, me, me not playing games at that point wasn't so much down to me not being good enough. It, there was some bad elements of looking there. The second year, obviously, I think the, the, the anybody going to Liverpool in the first year and, do, and doing what I did, where I played most of the games, scored goals, certainly made quite a few goals, I would have thought. Technically, the staff would have been happy with that, which then was obviously Joe Fagan because Joe took over from Bob. But he didn't. He went straight out and signed Michael Robinson. And he made it clear that Michael, even though Michael got off to a really, really bad start, Joe was very, very loyal. Loyalty to Michael that eventually got Michael through it and, and Michael became obviously a first-team regular. Um I don't quite think I would have, have had that period of time uh, to, to, to find me feet at Anfield. But anyway, Michael took that time to do it. So Michael was in the starting 11 with, with Kenny and, and, and Rushi, and I was sort of on the bench most of the games. And that, I didn't deal with that well. And when I got about the mental strength earlier on, I looked for an excuse to get out. I used that as an excuse to get out of Anfield. I'm not in the starting 11. I was on the bench a lot, but obviously not getting on and things like that. I used that excuse. I think I'm using. I'm, I'm being honest to myself to get out of to get out of Liverpool and and and, and get back to something. So, so after a few positional changes, after you scored the opener win at Aston Villa, you ended up playing 15 in a row. Teams like Blackburn in the FA Cup, West Ham, Burnley in the League Cup. But you actually got to the final of the League Cup three years in a row. What was that triumph like to now reach a final? I didn't play in the final, and that I think this is where the, the Quincy's uh, illness came into it. So I took ill. We, I remember this clearly. We took, I remember waking up in the morning, we were going down to play at Brighton, and I collapsed in my house, passed out. Okay. I was on my own at the time, and my girlfriend wasn't there. And I went in early to the ground to see Joe and said, Joe, look, I've passed out. Something's not right. Liverpool mentality, honestly. Anybody else would have got you straight into a doctor, got you checked out, etc. You'll be fine. Turns out I wasn't fine. So we went all the way down. Craig Johnson was a roommate and he had to call the doctor, club doctor, and say, I need you in the room quickly. They came in and they said, right, you're not, you're not well. I was never going to play. I was, I was so ill. I remember sitting on the bench. I had about, back then we used to wear like ski suits. It's like a warm, like a ski. I had two or three of those on. I was in a bad way. So that's when the illness kicked in and the cup final was on the Saturday. And, and I remember Joe, this is one of the things that I sort of had a bit of a fallout with Joe. When I told him I was Ugland, he made reference to, if you don't play this, you won't play on Saturday. And the bottom line was, I couldn't play in that because I was so ill. So I obviously I wasn't even physically 
fit for the for the final. So I was poorly. I, I remember not even I didn't even see the game on the game on the TV. I was so ill. So I missed out on 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 playing in the final. And I think I deserve to be in that start eleven because I think if you look at the the games leading up to it in the, in the, in, in, in the different rounds, I actually think I scored goals in those games. I, th I think I scored some yeah. crucial goals. So I didn't make that final, and that was all down to to illness. As I said, I was out for about six weeks with this particular injury, this illness at the time six seven weeks. I lost so much weight. Uh, so yeah, was, so I missed off in that final, and you go back to the Villa game. The Villa game, I remember that as well. One, because I had a great relationship with Gary Shaw. Gary Shaw was playing that day, obviously. But the pitch was solid. Absolutely solid. It would never, ever, ever be on today. Never. Okay? And it was dangerous. And I remember Sammy Lee taking a free kick, keeper pirate it, and uh, I followed in, side foot in. I actually had a hand in this one and won the goals as well. So, again, played well there. So, did you just see how I went on a run of 15 games on the run? And yes. Then, one of fifteen. Oh. Uh, well, yeah, that that might be the starting point, the Villa game, which which got me back in the frame. Yeah. What was that like to come back from that illness where you've collapsed and maybe you weren't in the best of mindsets to then come back and play? What was the rehabilitation like to to get you back? No from rehabilitation. Play? Really? No Just pushing it. Not whatsoever. No. So I was ill. Came back. Um, I'd love to know the time scale between getting back on the train ground. But the, I remember the first person I met that morning this is where me and Joe had a little bit of fallout. I'm coming down the tunnel, the passageway to the change room. Joe come down. He went, oh, you're back, are you? Nothing more than that. And when I look back, I thought, had Joe listened to me when I said I'd passed out, they might have been able to address my situation quicker, obviously. We never know. But it was just that flippant, nonchalant comment. That, but that, that was Liverpool. You had to accept that's Liverpool. Whether when I was doing that or whether Sooness was coming down, Hansen, Dan, it doesn't matter. I think they probably would have said the same thing. I'm, I'm assuming they would, or at least I'm hoping they would. Oh, you're back, are you? I've just been out for six weeks. Nobody's seen me. And so that was my, my, first, my first day back. So there was no rehab. So I'd have come back, I'd have gone to training. They probably would have seen that I wasn't fit, obviously, because you've you've lo I've lo I've lo I've lo So I would have probably had some training period, maybe week, 10 days. I must have played one or two reserve games. And then obviously the Villa game. So somebody might have been injured for me to be in that starting 11 against the Villa. I'd be interested to find out. And, uh, and of course, obviously the chance came. It wasn't a chance, I was selected. And, and I obviously delivered and delivered there on from there after. For, yeah. Well, you actually came back to a European night versus Polish side, but versus a Polish side. But you didn't go through because you lost 2 0, shockingly, in that first leg. But you replaced Uglish because he was injured. But again, you scored, but it wasn't good enough to go through to the next round of the European Cup. Yeah, Graham, I thought if I remember that, and I can't remember the, the way game, 2 3, but I remember coming to Anfield. Who in the world would ever believe this side in Poland was ever going to turn? I think that they scored, they, they, that obviously we needed to think. And I remember Graham slipping. So Graham received a simple pass and he lost his footing. And they went through and scored, which obviously give them a three. We might have scored, I can remember now, but we it gave them the advantage. My goal on that particular night, I'd love to see it again somehow or somewhere. But I remember it being like a scissor kick. In the cop, so but obviously it wasn't enough to get us through. But I remember doing the scissor kick, great goal, blah blah blah. But there was, excuse me, there was no urgency from the players to get the ball and restart because it obviously must have been very late on in the game. And I think we still need another two goals to to go through. I remember that game vividly in terms of, i.e., getting that goal and that happening. But it was, I remember Graham slipping, which was very, very rare that Graham made an error. He just happened to make an error on that night, which cost Liverpool Football Club dearly. Yeah. You did win a league medal. Uh, you played 23 games and scored four goals. But when you look back, that you had the option to join Liverpool and you actually rejected it first time. But then obviously you went to go and accept it. Would you ever have regretted that, having known you could have won a Premier League, uh, well, the equivalent of a Premier League? You know what? Knowing it and then actually achieving it. 
I would I think I prefer to have thought more of a memory oh, that could have been me because I'll tell you why Liverpool Football Club had already win, won so much for, 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 for so many years that the, the theory philosophy is once that game's gone it's forgot about and the next game's more important so the, you don't get no ceremony at Liverpool Football Club where you go in and you stand in line someone shakes your hand and puts a medal that's a league medal by the way on you you walk in the change room and if you've played enough games, there's a medal hanging up on the change room locker. That was it. And you go in and it's hanging there. In my case, I was one of the early birds in the change rooms then back in the day. And it was just hanging. It was just hanging there. That was it. Nothing said, nothing done other than Ronnie Moran would come in. Now then, you big heads. You used to call everybody big heads. Uh, that's finished with now. You may as well go and stick that in your, your drawer back at home. We've got another season to get on with it. That's how they thought which was great when you look back. 1983 was a difficult year for you. You only had five appearances. You only started one and a nil-nil draw. Um, and your only goal was in a 4 nil cup win over Brentford. And then you ended up leaving and moving to Sunderland. But that year, to summarise into quite a short time, do you remember that year? If so, what happened? I remember, I remember that year more than I remember the year that I played regular. Why? Because I could not get my head round how I'd gone to Liverpool, gone into starting 11 right from the off, played X amount of games, scored X amount of goals, had two bad illness, one bad illness, one injury, okay, which cost me dearly. They they certainly took what they were great one of these 10 games. Okay. So in theory, my mindset was I probably would have played the entire season. And here I was going into the second season, and Joe went out and bought Michael. I I I didn't deal with that. Michael ended up being my very close friend, I may add, and we lived together on the Wirral on the other side. We travelled in every day. So it wasn't as if I had anything against Michael. I, I, we loved it to death. There was no problem. I just couldn't understand why that decision. One year earlier, they bring me to the football club. Apparently, they tried to sign me the year earlier than what they did. They bring me. And then within one season, having played a lot of games for Liverpool, I suddenly find myself not, not, even, in, not even in the squad. Uh, uh, that was the bit. I, I'd, never, I'd never encountered that. I'd gone in at Middlesbrough from the beginning, stayed in, gone in with England, stayed in, come into Liverpool, played virtually all the games when I was fit. And then all of a sudden, second season, I'm like, not even in the, not even in the storm. Left. I, I didn't deal with that very well. And that's probably where when I said about the mental attitude, I, sh I wish I could look back and think, I should have accepted it, dug deep, and basically said, I will get back in that team. And I, and I, I didn't have that mindset. You you demanded to leave, right? And then you ended up to sign for Sunderland. If, I, if, if I'll tell you the truth, I I think well actually Michael wrote them out for me because Michael was a bit more articulate than me. And his writing was certainly better than mine. He wrote me out about twenty transfer requests, and every every week or every other weekend or every fortnight I'd go and put one under the manager's door, basically saying I want to leave. He never he never opened one of them, and then before I left. I went to see him and he said, right, listen, don't want you to go. We want to look at you changing your position in the team. And he wanted me to play right side in the field. It was funny because we we just come back from a tournament in in South Africa and I played right side midfield in these particular games against Spurs. He done very, very well. I didn't find the position difficult to play. And they had in their head, they'd done it before with different players. They had in their head that they could see me playing in this particular position. And at the time, I was, I am to this day, and, and at the time, Sammy was my, cl my close friend. And I couldn't understand because he is Liverpool through and through. What a great player. Whether they were thinking about the Sammy moving Sammy into the centre, um, uh, I'm, I'm not too sure. But I sort of had this mindset, well, basically taking a role of a, cl a close friend. I, I didn't deal with it very well. I said that to Joe. I actually said that to him. And he said, that's not for you to worry about. That's for us to worry about. Which is a fair point, to be honest with you. Um, so I, I could have stayed, even though I'd put in all these transfer requests. And he he was still basically wanting me to stay at the club. But I didn't, I didn't enjoy my time under Joe for that year. As I said, great person. 
Um, I'll tell you a little story at the end of this, which he did, which I thought was something that stuck in my head as well and for the rest of my life, certainly in management. So I handed all these requests in. I now joined Sunland. The rules back then were if you hand a transfer request in, you hand your rights to your sign-on fee. You basically forfeit it. But that's only if the letter has been handed to the directors of the football club. You're never handed one letter to a director of the football club at all. And with that, he was able to pay me my sign-on fee. And I thought that was, I thought that was special. Eh? Not that I wanted the money. Oh, of course, yeah, of course you want the money. But it wasn't about the money. It was the fact is how he did it and how he told me when he when he said, I've never opened one of them, Hodgie. And if I'd opened one of them, you would be getting your sign-on fee. And he said, I didn't need to open them because I knew exactly what they would say that you wanted to leave. Now, that was, that was special. That was special. How would you describe your time at Sunderland? Just to sum up two things here. So you lost in the cup final to Norwich in 1985 in the League Cup. And then Sunderland were relegated with 40 points. But that was quite a marginal gap between yourself and I believe it was Leicester at the bottom of the table, I think with 17 points. But you were quite you were quite deep into the relegation zone. What was that year like for Sunderland to get relegated? Did Norwich, did Norwich go down with us? I believe so. I believe so. Yeah, yeah, Norwich went down. Okay. So that season at Sunderland started so well. So well for the club. Uh, I got off to a great start as well. Really enjoyed it. I got, unfortunately, went and picked up another knee, knee ligament injury against Notts Forest. But however, but got off to a great start, even to the point I was trying to convince Sammy to come and join us. And uh, because we were flying, we were actually flying, you know, we were up there sitting in the fourth league, doing really well. We had great, 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 when I look back, a um, lot of pace in the team, myself, Howard Dale, Clive Walker, People like, you know, good players. And so I think at the time we got to a great start. And obviously, it, the, I think the cup, the cup run distracted the football club. And we lost sight of the league. Is it, is it, it was a case of, right, we'll win the cup and then we'll get our mind back on the league. And it just didn't happen. But that first year at Sunderland for me, I supported Sunderland as a kid. So for me to go back to Sunderland, that was me going home in theory even though I played for the Borough, of course. But in reality, that I support them since I was four or five years of age. So that was my that was my dream move, going back to Sunderland. Okay? Um, but unfortunately, it went horribly wrong when we got beaten in, in, in the... We, we, we'd played Norwich the week before, the cup final, and beat them 3-1 down at their ground. And then the day of the game at Wembley, God bless him, he's no longer here, Len Ashurst, our manager, changed the, changed the team on the morning of the game. And the whole day just became a disaster, absolute disaster. A lot of players, you know, psychologically dropped their heads, blah, blah, blah. I nearly scored after about 15 seconds, shot from about 10 yards inside of their half, and it just went over Chris Woods' head, hit the top of the crossbar, another six inches, in it, and I beat him. And uh, we would have got off to a great start. But listen, the, the cup final was a decide, it was a big factor in, in, in that Sunderland, uh, Sunderland history of Sunderland that year. Yeah. Five goals in 40 games across two seasons for Sunderland, but that still was not the end of your story. A, few, a free move to the finalist Norwich City. And this is where it got a bit, maybe a bit chaotic for you because you chose Norwich over Gothenburg, who actually won the UEFA Cup that year. So when you look back at that, you thought Norwich or Sweden and then even a UEFA Cup win. What do you think about that? Let me tell you, and I've told this previously, so and this is fact. I got offered IFK Gothenburg. I got offered loads of clubs in England. Think about it. Two years earlier, I'd been played. I got. I didn't get freed from Sunderland Football Club because I couldn't play. I got freed because the manager of Sunderland Football Club didn't matter what I'd done, was never, ever, ever, ever going to play me. Laurie McMenemy, okay? Was never going to play me. Okay? Don't know why. Don't know to this day why, okay? But he was never, ever going to play me. And he freed me. I got offered so many opportunities. My old club, the Borough, uh, Queen's Park Rangers, Jim Smith, offered me a fortune to go down. And when I look back, a fortune, especially in them days, okay? And lots of other offers. IFK Gothenburg, as you said. Ken Brown rang me. And they just got promoted. And he said, uh, listen... Really love you. 
watched you all your life. He said, but I'm a little bit concerned about the stories I'm getting out of Sunland. So that would only have come from one person. And he said, and with that, I'd probably only want to give you a one year deal. But he said, I'll understand if you turn it down because you've probably got enough, loads of, I had lots of offers. And I took that one year deal solely to spite, and I'm 90%, 99, well, I'm 100% certain anyway. Laurie had bad mouthed me to Norwich City at the time. I know that. Listen, it happened in football in those days, okay? Managers would ring up managers. It doesn't happen today, but they would ring up and say, what he? And I know he did not speak well of me. For, and I don't know why. I really, if, if I could tell you one little thing, I'd tell you, I don't know. Not a clue why, okay? But, and I chose Norwich for that reason. One year deal, no more. And unfortunately, I got a bad back injury against Manchester United. Chris Turner, my old teammate, Came out for a ball, put his knee up and caught me in the low end of the back and put my back out. And uh, I was out for quite some time. And then I went and broke my arm, unfortunately. So that one see, I got off to a great start. I think I scored a hat trick on my debut. Got off to a good start, but then I had these again. And at the end of the year, Ken said he was. He wanted to bring a big name in. I remember him telling me that. And I quite, uh, he said to me, I said, well, could I ask who the big name is, Gaffer? And he said, Robert Fleck. And I went, F-L-E-C-K. It's only five letters. Mine's got more. And you're saying that's a bigger name. <laughs> Bit of a sarcastic gesture, to be honest with you. And uh, I left. But listen, Norwich was a lovely club. Lovely people. A little bit of a cul-de-sac. You're basically out there on your own. Yeah. And you end up where you live in that city full stop. And I enjoyed every moment of it. Yeah, definitely. We haven't got too long left, but you ended up going back to Middlesbrough for a loan spell in 1987 in February for the last few months of the season. Do you remember that time going back? And if so, yeah. what would you have wanted to come from that? Yeah, so one, one, I didn't want to go. Okay. Um, I wasn't fit. I'd just come back from, from the injury. I knew I wasn't fit. Um, did I want to go back to Borough, having been there and the, the public remembering the Hodgy that they had, as opposed to the Hodgy that was going to come back on loan? Anyway, I got, I, got, I, got, I got bullied in with a bit of both, from, a little bit from Norwich and, and certainly a lot from Bruce Riel and, and Colin Todd at the time. So I asked, yeah, okay. So I accepted to go back. I told you I, I, I knew it was thing. I played the first game was we had Bournemouth. Don't know, okay, I can't remember what the result was, to be honest with you. And then the second game was against Bristol City at uh, Ayrson Park. Joe Jordan was playing for Bristol City and Keith Curl. And Joe Jordan had just tried to go and, 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 and injure a lad called Colin Cooper, centre back. And I seen it and I turned it on like normally. Listen, you're picking on a kid. You want to pick on somebody? Try picking on myself, except it's and Keith Curl chirped in. Keith Curl happens to be a really nice guy, by the way, okay? But Keith chirped in. I didn't know Keith at the time. He was a player that I was up against. And I think I said to me, I said, listen, you won't be on this pitch at the end either, by the way, if you're going to carry on. And something like that. And the incident took place. And then me and Keith Curl went for a ball. We slid in. And as I'm getting up, I've smashed Keith Curl in the face. Linesman seen it, told the referee, red card. So my loan spell was already cut short. So what Burr had done, they fined me the remaining three weeks' wages. So basically, I'm now fine. I've gone up there to do them a favour and they've taken three weeks' wages off me. Listen, I was a manager for 450 games. I would not have done that. Okay? I, I came up to help them and yet they went and punished me. Okay, yeah, I got sent off. I understand that. But you don't find them three weeks' wages. And, and anyway, so the bottom line is, I end up going back to Middles. I went back to Norwich. And at that point then, because of all these people, managers, personal issues that they have, I then made a decision that I probably would have won two things. One, walked away from football. Truthfully, I was there. I always wanted to go to coaching. So that was always in my head. Or I go abroad. And I decided to go abroad. I, I went because... I just wanted to get away from English football. I just wanted to get away from the people who run football clubs, to tell you the truth. 
if I was a footballer, and I often ask people, ask other players this, why would you not have chosen to go abroad in the first place? Surely that's the better option to go abroad and play you know, in a hot country, good wages, and just you know live the life out in Spain, which is what you went on to go and do. Well, I, yeah, but back then that wasn't the case for for English football players. In theory, um, natural step was for me to go from Reggie Boys to the Borough. If I'd if if I hadn't got transferred to Liverpool, I probably would have stayed at the Borough for my entire career. Okay. Then unfortunately, I got to Liverpool, or fortunately, depending on how you want to look at it. And the second season didn't work out. And then things just started. I, I, I had one year at Sunderland under Len Asher, so who's not here, God bless him. And we had a great season, but obviously we struggled uh, as a team. But, but as a personal issue, I thought I did quite well, a good season. Okay. And then of course Norwich. And I just I just honestly, the second season of Sunderland and Norwich, it was a case of going. Had that had that not happened, I probably I don't know about that. Would I have gone abroad? I don't, I don't know. I think it was me escaping. It was me just getting away from how people are and, 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 and how people become personal. If you're managing a football club, you can't become personal. You're managing on behalf of somebody else. You do it to your best ability to get the best out of the players. You don't get personal with players where you lose that player in the change room. And clubs still have to pay the player the wages, even though the manager has got a personal issue against them. That's that. I, I, I'd gone by then. So when the Spanish thing came, I didn't speak a word of Spanish. Um, I, off I went. And, and yeah, it was probably the best thing I could have ever happened to me. Then you moved, well, we're going to jump a few teams here. You ended up going to Japan. So now you've gone from a few spells over in England, back to Sheffield Wednesday um, from Spain. And now you're going to Japan, the other side of the world. Did you speak Japanese? No, no, I didn't, no. Um, I loved it. It was a, incredible. I'd been out there playing as a player. It was an opportunity for a ridiculously different lifestyle. Financially, the offer was exceptional. Okay, I was a che I still another year to go Sheffield Wednesday, so I went to see Big Ron and told him I've got this great opportunity to go to Japan. He said, "Well, look at you're part of my plans here." And I actually said, "Ron, listen, I don't think I'll even get through twenty games." I was starting to struggle with some some Achilles tendon injury time, blah, blah, blah. It was a bit of that in my head and also the fact that the financial package was so good. So big run and fantastic. Honestly, again, they're, they're dying breed. People like Ron Axe, they're dying breed in football. They, I'll get you out of your club. I'll get you out of here. You can go on a free. Go and enjoy yourself. But do not tell anybody what you're in. And he said, oh, you'll cause a mass riot that they'll all want to leave. Anyway, put my so I got this chance to go to Japan. Bill Fawkes was the manager, ex-Manchester United legend, ex-Munich survivor. Um, and I enjoyed it. I had a, a good time. Played games, picked up, a, again, stupid knee injury again, ligament injury. Um, loved the life, loved the way that the Japanese went about the, the professional aspect of it. Had a huge amount of respect for them. Got on so well with everybody in the club. Two years each, Tony Henry and Alan Irvine. I'd only signed one year. And um, they, the board, the guy, Mr. Imanishi, his name was, came to see me and he said, Listen, we want you to stay, but we want you to stay as the coach and the manager. Because I was having a big say in the change room with things, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'd been brought up right. And I'd been brought up, you never bite the hand that feeds you. And I said that to them. I said, Mr. Imanishi, listen, Bill Fox has brought me here. He wanted me to take Bill's job. No. That was the one thing I didn't like about their mentality of the job. That, I didn't like that bit. I said, no. And I said, uh, I'm going back. I had a knee injury. I'd been out in hospital for six weeks with it. I had to come back to Little Shawl and spend 13 weeks at Little Shawl to get fit. And, and, and that's exactly what I did. And that's what I uh, came back to the UK. Then you went to France. You went from Japan to France for one year. Um, and then after that, it follows a few spells uh, in England. But for France in Mets, you know, quite a big name in, in the modern day of football. What was that like? What was the treatment like of players over there? So I I was there for two years in Mets. I sang two yeah. seasons. OK. Um, I went on trial, played against Saarbrücken in a preseason game. Done so well. With a knee injury, I may add, I st I'd picked up the last two or three days at Little Show. It was a little bit of a setback for me. And the people at Little Show knew 
actually what they did, the, the drill that they did, they made this God, made me have, actually have the injury. As it happens, I had no choice. I knew I was going. I went and put a lot of work in it, little short, a lot of work. So I was obviously in reasonably good condition, match fit, and obviously not. But so I went on a pre season game against Saarbrücken. I remember strapping my knee up below the knee so the technic couldn't see it where the sock was protecting it. And I must have played the game in my life because straight after the Straight after the game, they came and they actually were to, to stop. They said, David, we'd like you to stay to play on the on, on, on the Saturday game. I said, no, I've got too many offers in England. I don't want to do that. It's this point. Anyway, I, I, I sent two-year deal. And I was only one, two weeks into it. Um, and then I went and done my knee again in training, but I already had the knee injury. I, I had that for the medical, for example. I knew. I, I actually... Literally cringed getting through the medical, you know, the winced with it when they were doing the anyway. I got through it and I signed, and uh, so I signed two years, but I went and got injured again within the first week. So that set me back. I put me in a little bit of a difficult situation with the owner of the club, he wasn't happy. So I had a little bit of an issue with, with Mets, but listen, I loved it. It was, uh, it was a great experience, loved the club, loved the coach, a guy called Joel Muller, who was the I will go down and say he's the best coach I've ever, ever, ever played for. And I'm talking about Terry Venables, Ron Atkinson, Dave Sexton, Howard Wilkinson. Liverpool weren't coaches, but I'm putting all those people in the hat. And I'm telling you that this guy was the best ever. And I wrote everything down that he, that he taught me, everything. So I had a great time, loved the city, loved the players, made some great friends. And... But at 31 years of age, I came out of there and I knew that I had to retire. Had to retire. Yeah. Retiring then, what was that like to play such a prestigious career, but then to retire, to end it all there, to end the footballing career? I mean, you spoke earlier um, when you were playing for the other clubs that you had the thought of retiring early. But to retire after so many clubs, so many teams, what was that feeling like? Listen... The truth is, and it's how I am as a character. It's how I am a person and how I think. I've told you about the, the, the Bill Fawkes thing, and, and, and I can give you several other ones as well, but that will be taking us off track slightly. I woke up at 31 years of age, turned to, to my wife next to me, and basically said, that's it, I'm finished. And she was sort of like very shocked. We've not long been married. She said, are you serious? From a fitness perspective... I would probably still be up in the top two or three in any club. From an injury perspective, I had knee injuries. I had Achilles tendon injuries. I had a lower back injury. Achilles were the biggest problem, okay? If I signed for a club, they were going to pay me potentially for doing nothing. I, I, that, I'm not that. That's not my character. I couldn't, I couldn't have lived with it. I'd struggled with it on, in Mets, for example. In, in France, I'd, that's they had basically got paid for doing nothing. So I, I just made a decision. That was it. Thingy. And of course, my mindset was, I'd, look, I'd learned French and Spanish. I'd played abroad. I had a big belief that there was a lot of lads in England who could play abroad. And, and, and so that, that was the one that took me down the route to become an, an agent uh, is my next step in my, in my life. But what about being the Darlington manager three times? That's that's quite a lot. Of, that's a lot of uh, times to be a manager of one club. Agency, and my wife was very unhappy when I decided to. I told you early on in the interview, and I'd always had this in my head. I wanted a coach. Once I was only thirty-four when I got the job at Borough. Ed Dollar, sorry, and uh, accept the job. There's a long story leading up to that, but I, anyway, in the end, I accepted it. And um, so I'm going into a change room where I could have played and been better than any of those players in that change room at that time. And uh, but there was I got a call, funny enough, of Kenny Daglish on when he'd heard I'd just been appointed. And he called me up and I know exactly where I was and I know exactly what he said. And he, and the, but the three things he'd be, he said to me, Podgy, Am I right in saying you've just took the dollar job? And I said, yeah. And he asked the question, why? Because I, because he knew my agency was good and he knew what I was doing in terms of overseas players was also good. 
And I said, well, I, I think it's the next stage I've always wanted to do. And he said, okay, I'm going to give you three pieces of advice. One, do not expect them players to be at your level. Judge them for where they are. Great bit of advice. Probably might, might have had that mindset, but however, he only implemented it even further than me. So that was a great, good thing. Two, remember, the club has been there for 100 years and it'll be 100 years there after you. You're only a cog in a clock. Do everything that's right for your football club. And that's Kenny Daglish because of how he also thinks for Liverpool. He is Liverpool through and through. He will always put the club before himself. Yeah. Okay? Number two. And three, be lucky. Because if you haven't got luck, you'll win nothing. And that was the one thing that never came my way in my period of time at Dalton Football Club. Football-wise, we played great football. Every year, we, we better and better and better, and we got beaten two playoff finals. But we just never had that one little bit of luck to get us that promotion. Oh, that, that's my thing, okay? So I decided to go into management. Uh, I always wanted to do it. I walked into the change room on the first day, or met all the players prior to that, went in, and I was not daunted by the task in any shape or form at all. I was extremely comfortable doing the sessions. I was even extremely comfortable because I'd learned so much from abroad that these guys had never heard of. And I'm going, and you can ask any of those players, do any interview with them, will say to you, when the gaffer or Hodgie, depending on what they call me, I'm going back 30 years nearly now, okay? I was into rehydration, fluids, training sessions stopped 15 minutes, make sure the players had drinks, especially through the hot weather, okay? I made sure they had food before, I made sure they had food afterwards. We stretched before every session, we stretched down every, at the end of every session. We had breaks in between just to give the bodies a chance to recover, blah, blah, blah. So I was doing all those things 30 years ago. And it was not because I'm, I knew all of that. It was because I'd learned all of that from the cultures in Japan and then people like Joel Muller at, uh, at, at FC Mets and, and other people along the way. I'd gathered all of that information and made sure that when the time came, I would implement it in, in how I was as a coach or a manager, whatever terminology you want to use, yeah. David, I really, really thank you for joining me today. It's been an absolute pleasure talking everything Liverpool, Sunderland, Norwich and so many more. Thank you very much for joining me. Jamie, loved it. Thank you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Thank you.